If anyone needs to say something, you know how to unmute yourself and ask, ask a question. So because, I'll begin with the topic. Because the program is run by Mizrahi, and because it's Matot Masay this week, uh, of course we have to talk about the mitzvah to conquer the land of Israel. So that obviously is going to be the topic. Uh, but also this week share I wanted to dedicate in memory of Rav Yudam Itau, uh, who's 10th your site is this weekend. And he was my Rosh Hashiva, and a lot of my, um, uh, for the, my, my approach to Tznach, I learned from Rav Yol Benun primarily, but my understanding of Judaism are pretty much absorbed from Rav Amitam. Uh, but one word, I'll share a little story with you. Um, one time I was in um, a visit, to, I forget what school I think, in Denver, so, some school in America, and we were doing you know, teacher training, things like that, or a teacher, yeah, I met with teachers and go over curriculum and stuff like that. So one of the teachers says, um, she wants a curriculum. I mean, actually, it was a he. He says, he wants to work on a curriculum. He wants to work on a curriculum, how to teach your Shemaim. Understand the idea? The teacher, very like young teacher, very energetic. He wants a curriculum for teaching his students your Shemaim. So I told him, uh, you know, it's a nice idea. I told him, your Shemaim is not something you teach. It's something you absorb. You can't teach your Shemaim. It's something you absorb. And that's what I got from Rabbi Mital. Um, it's not something you teach, it's something by being near a person, hearing, being, being, just watching him act, listening to him talk. It's something you absorb from someone. I think in Jewish education, that's, you have to remind, you can teach how to read Hebrew and how to understand and how to understand Parshanim and things like that. But you have to remind, it's something you absorb from your, from your home, from your family, from your rabbin, from your teachers, and from your friends. So, um, he didn't agree with me, but <laughs> that was something else. But that, that, that teacher still wanted a curriculum. But I told him, you know, teachers, you can't outsource what has to happen in the home to the school. You can only, the school can teach. Yerat uh, Shemaim can, can happen uh, not frontally, but through it, like in an informal way. So with that in mind, I want to share with you an understanding of, of, um, of the mitzvah to sort of, I would say, I'll, I'll say right now, to conquer the land of Israel or possibly to live in the land of Israel. So to begin with, let's look at the source, which is like straightforward and nice and simple. And then like I always try to do, I want to look at that source in light of its wider context. So let's take a look at the end of Parshat, at the end of Parak 33, I'll, I'll share my screen. Open up your Chumashim. First to the end of Parak Lamed Gimel in, let me get the screen right. Got my calendar there, let's get back to it. Look at numbers. Look at Parak Shoshim in Parak 33, Lamed Gimel, which is Parshat Masay. Parshat Masay is a list of all the travel that people do. And it's pretty boring, but we travel from the time we leave Egypt to we get to Israel. After we arrive in Arvot Moav, listen carefully, the last two stops. In Pasuk Memchet. That's our last travel. We set up camp in Arvot Moav, opposite Yericho. We set up camp up to the Jordan River, like right opposite Yericho, but on the other side of the Jordan River, by Ebel Shitim in our vote Moab. And that's where basically, uh, we actually, we had this, that actually happened back in Parshat Chumat, but the rest of Chumash happens, where basically all of Sefer Dvarim in the last section of Sefer uh, Bamidbar, all take place in our vote Moab. And that's where Sefer Yeshua begins. Okay. Now that we've finished that summary of all our travel, we have a commandment. By Dabar Hashem and Moshe, Barvot Moab, Al Yidem Richol Emor. God commands Moshe and Arvot Moab following. Dabar Bene Israel, the Marta Dahem. Ketem of Rimet Yarden and Eretz Canaan. As you pass over the Jordan, pretty soon to Canaan. And here's the famous line. Bo Rashtem et Koyesh Veha Aretz Pipdehem. What do you need to do? You have to, um, I guess, conquer or possess the inhabitants of the land in front of you. Be Baretem et Komaskiotam. Get rid of all their idols, all their, um, all their idol worship. Basically, get rid of any place of idol worship. You're coming up to set up a nation representing the one God, 
And if you allow all these idols and images of other gods around, it might like, it might lead people astray. So that's one commandment. What's the next commandment? Pasik nun gimel. Borashtem et ars vi shaftemba. You have to possess the land and settle it. Why? I'm giving you this land to possess. This is the Pasik that we'll see in a minute the Ramban's going to build that it's mitzvah to say. This is the Pasik of conquering the land and possessing it. And now after you conquer it, what do you need to do? Once you conquer the land, then you have to parcelize the land to its inhabitants. And how do you do it? By a lottery. If someone is a rabbi, he gets a, a larger, I'm joking, that doesn't mean that. doesn't mean if you're a rabbi, you get a bigger portion. It means um, you give out, you parcelize the land based on proportionate population. In other words, how do you give out land? Based on how, how big, how many people are in your family. For example, if you're a family of uh, two parents and two children, you get 3,000 shekel. If you're two parents, you get 750 shekel. I'm just joking, uh, based on the news. What's that mean? There seems to be an internal contradiction here where do you give out the land by lottery or do you give out the land by size of your, of your population? Well, it's really simple. Um, let's say there's like a thousand dunam to give out. And the population is, let's say, a hundred. So every, every um, person gets 10 dunam. Got the idea? Now, which piece of land you get, that goes by Gora. Understand that the, the idea is that you give out the land equally based on relative population. To do that, you need to take a census, which we'll talk about soon. But once I've taken a census, I know how much land you're supposed to get. Who gets what, which piece of land? Then you have to draw straws. Then you have to make a goral. Got the idea? A goral is sort of to make sure it's fair. Because how come he got this land? How come he got that land? So there's equality, but also um, um, sort of depending on, on random equality. Because not everyone can get the same piece of land and the same quality of land. So simply, I divide up the land. The size of land is based on your population. And the piece of land is based on a goral. Then we have a final clause, which sounds like it was written for today. If you don't possess the land and the inhabitants of the land, if you leave them over, they're going to give you a hard time. They'll be like thorns on your side. And they're going to give you, if you don't get rid of them, they're going to get rid of you. And what, I, what you are supposed to do to them, they're going to do to you. Anyone who's a right-wing Zionist just thrives on these psukim, pretty much. It makes sense, you know, because we didn't wipe everyone out, that's why we're suffering today. I'm not saying that's my opinion. I'm saying but there's no doubt someone who reads these psukim can easily reach that, that conclusion. But if I take these psukim at face value, there's a commandment, number one, to conquer the land, to settle it, to divide it up, and to wipe out and get rid of all the existing inhabitants in the land. Got that? Um, and it sounds like it's a mitzvah. What's the problem? The big question is going to be, and here's where our is going to begin, is this entire section here, is this a mitzvah only for this generation, or is this a mitzvah for all generations? You understand my question? In Hebrew, is it a mitzvah l'sha'ah or mitzvah l'dorot? There's no doubt this is a commandment. Got it? This is written like a commandment. The question is, is this a commandment only for this first generation? This is a one-time commandment for that generation. Uh, very similar to the commandment to um, how they carry the Mishkan. And when we take a census, there's a lot of commandments in Sefer Bamidbar, which are only for that generation. Or is this a commandment for all generations, like most of Chumash? So we have to discuss now, that's the big question we wanted to discuss, we have to read these psukim in their context and see, are these mitzvot for all generations or just for this generation? And that'll help us understand what's going on. Um, before we continue, I want to read the Ramban, okay? I'm going to stop this share, one second, and show, I want to share a different screen. The famous Ramban that everyone always quotes, he's quoted like numerous times. He's exactly on these psukim. Let me find my word file. That's not the word file I wanted. 
I wanted a different word file. Here's the Ramban. The Ramban on Bamibar 33. First, he quotes the Pasuk. Okay. So what's Ramban say? Al dati zo mitzvah taseh. According to Ramban, this is a positive commandment. In fact, um, the Rambam doesn't write a book of commandments. He doesn't count them. Your screen isn't sharing the Ramban. Yeah, he just takes the he just takes the Rambam, the Maimonides, and argues. You know, it's, the, um, Maimonides he made a list of all six thirteen. So he disagrees which mitzvah to say he should have put in and which mitzvah to say he shouldn't have put in. So you've got the wrong, you've got the wrong screen on. Well, the wrong screen. Second, stop share. Let me try to share again. Share and. Here we are. Is that better? Hold on. It hasn't come yet. Yeah, it's okay. Yes. Okay, here it is. I'm sorry. Um, so this is the Ramban. Again, he quotes the Pasuk for Babibar 33. He says, Al tati zo mitzvah taseh. And in his Hasagot on, the, on Maimonides, this is Asaga number four. His mitzvah taseh number four that Ramban holds, the Ramban should have counted, but he didn't count. Why the Rambam doesn't count it, we'll talk about later. Okay. So what's the commandment? Otam otam. To live in the land and possess it. Because God gave it to them. Therefore, God wants us to live here. Therefore, we have to live in the land and settle it. And they shouldn't sort of despise the land. They say, oh, I hate this place. You have to sort of, you have to live in the land, possess it, and enjoy doing it. And don't like say, I don't want this land. If God gives you a present, let's say, let's say you give, um, let's say you're a grandparent and you give your grandchild a present, if they throw it out or don't like it, it's very upsetting. So therefore, God gave you something, enjoy it. Okay. Should the people decide, you know what, we'd rather go to Uganda or New Jersey or somewhere else. Let's say the Jewish people say, no, we don't like this land. We want to be a Jewish people. We want to live in a different land. Uh-huh. That would be a bitu mitzvah taseh. Which he's doing from a very technical point of view. He's saying, this is a mitzvah taseh for the Jewish people. And, if, and let's say the Jewish people decide I'd rather live in another land, there'll be, there'll be a bitu mitzvah taseh. There'll be, a, there'll be over on this mitzvah taseh. And then he's going to bring an example of where we see this in rabbinic literature. The rabbis take this mitzvah to an extreme. And they say, well, they said, remember, there's a mitzvah, you can't leave the land of Israel. Why is it in Ketuvot? Because if a wife says, I want to go to Chutzlaretz, and the husband says, I want to stay here, um, she loses her ksuba. The other way around, if the wife says, I want to move to Israel, and the husband says, I don't want, that's a reason for her to get her ksuba. Okay. Um, and if she wants to run away, she's considered a moredet. She's like rebelling. Um, or So that shows you how important the land is. If, let's say the wife says, I want to move, let's say they're living in Boston. And she says, I want to move back to Brooklyn. Okay, so that's not an Isham moredet. But if they're living in Boston and the husband says, I want to go to Israel, she has to follow. Okay. The Ish can do the same thing. No, that's the famous Kumik Subot. Bechan Itztavinu, so he's saying, this is a source for that Gemara in Ketuvot. The Talmud is such in Ketuvot that shows the priority of somebody wanting to live in Israel is all based on this commandment here. Okay. Now, you realize he's, he realizes that other people disagree with him. And therefore, he's buttressing as much as possible that this is a mitzvah taseh. Ki ha-ketuv hazeh hi mitzvah taseh. V'yachzir ha-mitzvah zu b'mkomot rabim. Now he's mitzvah taseh here. We see it over and over again. For example, Babur Shuat Aretz. Remember this Pasek? You know where it's from? We'll see in Sefer Dvarim in a minute where it's from. So it's Babur Shuat Aretz. Okay. Avorashi Piresh. Okay. Rashi on the same Sukim doesn't say this is a mitzvah. He says this is simply good advice. What's Rashi say? He says, how does Rashi explain this, this, this Sukim? Borashtem et Aretz borashtem ota biyoshveha az He says, if you possess the land, then you'll be able to live in it. If you don't conquer the land, you won't be able to live in it. In other words, Rashi doesn't understand this Pasuk as a commandment. He's saying it's simply good advice. Want some good advice? Get rid of the local population. You'll be able to live there. Don't get rid of them. They'll give you trouble. 
It's like someone giving advice, but it's not a, a positive commandment. Okay? And so that's Rashi's approach, which I guess he assumes probably that's why the Rambam didn't count it either. But you see that the Rambam realizes that a lot of other commentators don't consider this a mitzvah. And, but he says, Ramban says, what we explained, that's the ikar. You follow the Ramban? It's a famous Ramban. I'm hopefully, I'm assuming you've seen it before. Now I want to explain to you why almost everyone else disagrees with the Ramban and why they don't consider it a mitzvah to say. And that, which has nothing to do with how important the land of Israel is. Anyone who reads the Bible knows that God wants us to live in Israel. To understand the Machloket, we have to go and look at the last line of the book. So I'm going to take off my screen for a minute. And I just want to go and review uh, about Chumash in general. If there is a commandment in Chumash, where would I expect to find it? Let's go chronologically in Jewish history. Where, at what place does Amisel receive the majority of their mitzvot? This is real simple. R.C. Exactly. Oh, no. Yeah. It, we come to Mount Sinai. What, what should be the plan of Chumash? We should get out of Egypt. But God chooses us in Sefer Breshit. We're enslaved in Egypt. God redeems us from Egypt. Brings us to the desert. Brings us to Mount Sinai. We enter covenant to be God's people. We say, Nasa Venishma. We'll be a mamlechet koni b'goy kadosh. We get our contract. What we call, what you call the Ten Commandments. What um, Chumash calls divrei abrit. And then we get Parshat Mishpatim. And then Moshe goes up for 40 days and 40 nights to get more laws. And basically, if there are any laws that we're supposed to receive as God's people, we should get them at Har Sinai, either uh, on the day we got the Ten Commandments, on the first 40 days, or maybe after Chet Ege when we renew the covenant, or maybe some laws about how to use the Mishkan once we build the Mishkan. But we're, we're, we're in Camp Har Sinai for a year. We leave on the 20th of Iyar, remember? Then by Ibn Saron, that was back in chapter 10 in Sefer Bamidbar. And if there was any law to command the people, the law should have been given in that first year of Mount Sinai before we leave Mount Sinai. Because ideally, we should have left Mount Sinai, conquered the land, and lived happily ever after. That's what should have happened. In the meantime, things go bad. But if there's going to be a mitzvah later on, after we leave Har Sinai, there's got to be a good reason for it. Well, we'll see some examples of that. But in, in theory, all the commandments should have been given at Har Sinai. Now, let's look now, with that in mind, let's look, let's go back to Sefer Dvarim. And we're going to take a look now at the very end of the book. Look in chapter 36. Let's look, everyone have it, I hope now? Look at the last line of Sefer Bami, I'm sorry, Sefer Bami Bar. The last line of Sefer Bami Bar, what does it say? Ela ha mitzvot. But that, now, would you consider that a summary pasuk of Sefer Bamibar or the introduction to Sefer Tvarim? Something we even, I think we're going to stand up for this um, in Shul this weekend, right? When we read this pasuk, we stand up and that's, we say, Chazak, Chazak, Benit Chazak, that's the end of the book. Now, do you understand this pasuk is the end is the end of Sefer Bamibar or the beginning of Sefer Tvarim? What makes more sense? I'm asking a simple question. Someone give it a try? Beginning of Tvarim? You think this, you think the book is over and now this is introducing Sefer Tvarim? Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh, I was only joking when I brought up the possibility. Wouldn't it make more I mean, how does Dvarim begin? Eilat Dvarim Yishu Dibar Moshe Kol Yisrael has its own introduction. The last line of a book usually summarizes the book, doesn't it? Isn't this a summary? No. Eilat Mitzvah Mishpatim Asher Tzibah Shem Biyad Moshe Avel Bnei Yisrael Bravot Moab Are you there in I understand, I could, I could view it as an introduction. Put it this way. If there were five chapters in the books of Moses, then this might be the introduction to the fifth chapter or the segue, but we call them five books, but the Bible is its own book. It stands alone, has its own internal structure. It makes more sense that this is the last line of the book. But when you read a passage like this, it's, let me give you an example, just to clarify. Let's read this again. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Listen to how it sounds like a summary. Let's take a quick look. Let me open up a different book. Is Vayikra. Look at the last line of Sefer Vayikra. 
It's almost the same style. What's it saying? Ela ha mitzvot, asher tziva Hashem, the of Yisrael Bahar Sinai. Isn't that a summary at the end of the book? Now, is it summarizing the whole book or not? That's a different question. But this is not an introduction to Sefer Bamidbar, is it? This is the conclusion of Sefer Vayikra. Now, how come it says that these are the commandments that God commanded Moshe and Har Sinai? Because remember Parshat Bahar, some of the mitzvot in Sefer Vayikra were given in Har Sinai, or at Har Sinai. But in Vayikra, we haven't left Har Sinai yet, either on the mountain or at the mountain, but we're still at the Mishkan. So the mitzvot that are recorded in Sefer Vayikra were all given in Har Sinai, either on the first 40 days, second 40 days after the Mishkan was built. But this is a summary of many of the mitzvot that were given in, in, Sefer, in Sefer Vayikra. So it's just like this is a summary. Let's go back now. And um, let me stop my share again. And go back to Sefer, I'm sorry. Let's go back to the last line of Sefer Bamidbar. A mistake. Do you guys see Sefer Bamidbar now? Or you're still in Vayikra? No, we don't see anything. Now we got it. Uh, still. You got it? Uh, the Midbar, yes. This is less than the Midbar. Okay. Now, now you need your Chumash at home to do this now. If this is a summary, I'm assuming this Pasuk is summarizing the end of the book. Um, I need to find what it's summarizing. Someone explain to me why this is the summary of the entire book. Look at this line again. These are the mitzvot and mishpatim that God commanded Biad Moshe to Bnei Yisrael in our vote Moab. Why can't this be summarizing the entire book? Real simple. Because they've been journeying for 40 years and they've only just got to Moab just recently. Okay. Now, how recently did we get to our book Moab? That's a good question. We mentioned it in chapter 33. But if you know the narrative in Sefer Bamidbar, if I go back to the end of Parsha Chukat, which is the end of chapter 21, I think. Okay. At the end of chapter 21, um, we all do the, all that traveling. Um, I'm sorry, actually, actually, it's the first line of chapter 22. It's, it's a chapter division mistake. After we defeated Sichon and Og in the end of Parsha Chukat, we arrive in our Moab, and then we have the story of Balak. So um, let me go back now to chapter 36. And we, let's look at that last line. Look at this line again. So it's not summarizing the entire book. It can only be summarizing from Parshat Chukat. But it's also summarizing, but it's not summarizing stories, is it? Balak and Bilam is a story. The war, the, the um, Bnei Gedebun Revin is a story. I'm looking for mitzvot and mishpatim that God commanded Biad Moshe, Biad Moshe to Bnei Yisrael or Moab. So if it's not summarizing the entire book, it's summarizing part of the book. I have to see what it's summarizing, but what are the criterion? The criterion are, it has to be laws given in Revot Moav, and it has to be mitzvot and mishpatim. Okay? Now, let's see what the candidates are. And we'll go back. Um, you know what? Let's take a look and um, go back to chapter 33. The commandment we just read in the end of chapter 33 does this fit the criterion? Can, what's our criterion? Laws given through Moshe to the Pnei Yisrael and Arvot Moab. How does chapter, have to, how does verse 50 begin? By Daber Hashem and Moshe Barvot Moab, Aider Necho Lemor, Daber Pnei Yisrael Bar Marta Lehem. That doesn't fit the criterion? This commandment to conquer the land fits the criteria of the last line of the book. Agreed? Now, let's look at chapter 34. How does chapter 34 begin? This is a commandment telling B'nai Israel, these are the borders of the land of Canaan that you have to conquer. We just had a commandment to conquer the land. And what's God say? These are the borders of Israel that you need to conquer. Now, are these the eternal borders of the land of Israel? That's a good question. But it makes sense that once God tells the people, you have to conquer Eretz Canaan, I need to know what land I have to conquer. So that's the first section of chapter 34. And it makes sense that this commandment was given in our vote Moab. Um, and it has to be later, Why? Well, this can't be something from Harsinai, because it says here at the end, 
ויצב משה בן ישראל לאמור זאת על זה אשר תנחלו עד טוב וגורל אשר ציווה השם לתת את תשעת המטות. This land for the nine, for the nine and a half tribes, because the two and a half tribes already took their nachalah and they very hard thing. So this can't be a commandment that was given on Har Sinai. This was a commandment that was given only after we defeated Sichon and Ogin. We had the story of Bnei Gad and Bnei Ruven. Look at the next commandment. Pasik Ted Zayin. Vaydab Hashem Moshe Lemor. Eile Shmot HaNashim Asher Yinchalu Lachem HaAretz, El Azar HaKohen Ve'eshu HaBenun. Ve'nasi Echad, Nasi Echad Metet Yichud Le'tichot HaAretz, Eile Shmotam. The second section of chapter 34 are the list of the tribal leaders who are in charge of parcelizing the land. It's a committee of uh, mankalim, of, of, you know, of administrators, who are going to be in charge of giving out the land. That for sure is a commandment given in Arvot Moav, which relates to the commandment to conquer and parcelize the land. What I want to make clarify is that chapter 34 is a direct continuation of the end of chapter 33. The so given in Arvot Moav by God to Moshe to, to tell the people. Now, this last section, is this a commandment for all generations or just for this generation? Okay. This list of people who have to parcelize the land is clearly a mitzvah only for that generation. That's a one-time thing. Now, look at chapter 35. Look how it begins. Would this fit the category of the last line of the book? It's law given to Moshe to command B'nai Israel in our book Moab. So chapter 35 also fits in, and it's to set up the cities of the Levites and how big the cities are and where we're going to put them and how to divide them up. Remember? In other words, what cities of Levites go where? So you give out the cities based on the tribal census and based on the census of the Levites. But that's a commandment for that generation to parcelize the land. And then we have one more commandment. That's clearly a commandment given in our vote Moab. We have to set up our Rimi Klat. Okay? And the, uh, the, we have um, our Rimi Klat for the Goel Adam. And we set up six all together, three on one side of the Jordan, three on the other side of the Jordan. And three on one side. And three on, on every other day now. The first three were set up already, and now we have three more. Okay? And then we have the list, then we have laws about Arimi Klad. But that's again, that's another commandment to B'nai Israel given in Arbot Moab. And then finally, in chapter 36, what do we have? That takes us in chapter 35. In chapter 36, what do we have? Um, the second half of the Blot Sabchad story with the men of, Men of Menashe say, hey, if Benot Sofchad marry outside the tribe, we're going to lose that Nachala forever. Because when the Yovo comes, it's going to go back to their husband's family, and the husband's from a different tribe. And therefore, God says, you know what, you're also right. Therefore, they get Nachala, the women, but they have to marry within the tribe. And that's going to be a, uh, another law. And that's a question. Is this law only for the first generation, all generations, a big Machloket Parshemi? Now, therefore, if I'm looking, what does this final line summarize? Look again. This is clearly a summary of everything from chapter 33 to the end of the book. Agreed? It's a summary of, of commandments for that generation. Now, why weren't these mitzvot given on Har Sinai? Because we weren't ready for them yet. These are mitzvot given as we're about to conquer the land. They might apply to commandments given earlier. Already at Harsina, we have mitzvot about Ari Miklat, etc. But now we get the details of where to give them out. Now, um, I'm going to show you a different screen now and show you everything on a, on a list. Where's the list? Um, share my screen. And now we need to go to um, here. I think I, I showed, we did this one other time when we talked about the book of Midbar in general. Let me just review this. this, this um, I think I gave you Sharon Saber by Mibar once with this. Didn't I, give, didn't I give you this once? I think I shared with you. Did I ever show you this, this chart? It doesn't look familiar? This chart about Saber by Mibar. Does it look familiar? I guess not. So I better, I better explain it. You looked a little troubled. Okay. 
So let me talk about Sefer Bamidbar and see what this is. What did we just do? This is a chart of Sefer Bamidbar. I'll try to make it a little bit bigger now. Um, the, let's go Sefer Bamidbar, what belongs and what doesn't belong. In Sefer Bamidbar, we have what's called narrative, which is a story. Most of Sefer Bamidbar is a story. What should the story be? It should have been the story of Amisar leaving Har Sinai and moving with the Mishkan through the desert and conquering the land of Israel and setting up the land. Had we not sinned with the spies, that's what would have happened. Had we left Harsinai and not sinned on the way, we would have left Harsinai and gone to the land of Israel. Therefore, the first 10 chapters of the book is simply describing how the first generation gets ready to go in. I'll give some examples in a minute. And it ends with Vayibin Soharon. The middle section of the book, from chapter 11 to 25, is basically who doesn't make it and why. It's a sin of the failure of the first generation and some of the next generation. It's basically a story of who sins and who gets punished and why they get punished. That's the middle section. And starting in chapter 26, all the dying is over and who's ever left over, it's, a, it's how the new generation gets ready to go in. I'll make this a little bit bigger now and we'll, we'll see some examples. Um, in the first section, I'll go real quick in the first section. First, we, or, we can't, in the beginning of the book, first we count, we make a census, organize the camp, ready to travel on. Um, we dedicate the Mishkan, but we give the wagons that they're going to use to travel through the desert with. Um, we're going to replace the Bukharim with the Levim, get everything ready to go, and we're going to travel after Pesach Sheni. We travel following the Anan, we have Chatzot for traveling, and the Anan goes up on the 20th of the year, and we begin to travel by Ibn Soharo. So the first 10 chapters, nothing is negative, everything's ready to go, we travel. In the middle section, it's simply sin after sin. Mitavim, mitononim, Miriam talking, the sin of the spies, Korach's rebellion, Moshe and Aaron's sin, the Nachash Nechoshet. There's um, a base in the Benot Midian, Benot Moab. It's basically every single story, almost every story, has a sin and death and punishment. And it's basically the story of how we failed and why we failed. And starting from chapter 26, everything is good. We take another census. We have the Brot Safchad story. We have the war against Midian. Um, we have the two and a half tribes. And then we have uh, the summary of all of our travel in Masay and the border, everything we just read. At the end of the book, remember the borders of Eretz Canaan, see if Levi sees the refuge, and we finish the Brot Safchad story. Now, what happened interesting in the book is, which is a different share, which I thought we did before, is that as the book progresses through the narrative, it's consistently interrupted with commandments that belong in Sefer Vayikra. Remember in Parshat Naso, out of nowhere, we have laws of the Korban Hasham, we have laws of Sota, which all has to do with the Mikdash, we have laws of Nazir, we have Brikat Konim. This ongoing narrative is consistently interrupted with laws that belong in Sefer Vayikra. Um, after the sin of the spies, we have the laws of Korban of the Sachim, laws of taking Chalav, which relate to Israel. We have laws of Shabbat, laws of Tzitzit, and things like that, laws of Batmezit. But these are all laws that could have easily been in Sefer Vayikra, but for some reason, they're inserted in Sefer uh, Bamidbar. In the same way, after the story of Korach, we have the laws of Paraduma. Remember, Paraduma for sure belongs in Sefer Vayikra, but it's brought here. And then last week in Parsha Pinchas, out of, out of nowhere, we have the laws of the Tvidim and Safim, we bring on the holidays that belong clearly in, in Sefer um, Vayikra as well, in Parsha Namor. Do you understand the pattern? About Sefer? I hope that's clear. Again, why Chumash does that? That's a class in Sefer Bamidbar in general. If we have time, we'll talk about it. But in a nutshell, Sefer Bamidbar is primarily a book of narrative. And for some reason, in Sefer Bamidbar, the narrative is consistently interrupted with the laws of belonging in Sefer Vayikra. Okay. Why Chumash does that? There's a lesson behind it. It's, it's called, we call it the Peshat of Thrash. Kubish wants us to find a connection between the laws that we keep and the life that we live. But all the Parsha talk about Lama Nisma, why is this Parsha connected to that Parsha? Why are they all next to each other? But it's coming to teach you something based on context and, and um, <coughs> not only on content. But that's the style of Sefer Bamidbar. And therefore, when I study Sefer Bamidbar, I'm going to have two types of laws. About Mitzvot and Dorot, which most of them belong to Sefer Vayikra. And also, it's what the Sha'a that relate to that generation. For example, the commandment to count, um, to take a census in the beginning of the book, 
in the, sec in the second year was only for that generation. Um, dedicating the Mishkan was only that generation. The Chatzot for travel was there. On the side, there's also, we use them later in the Mikdash. That's something else you know, for, um, for, for, for fast days and things like that. Um, but all through, all, everywhere through the book, there are all these laws of the war against Midian and to go conquer Midian was a law for that generation because of the events. So that's why when we look at this bottom section now, let me, let me highlight what happens here at the end of the book. Because throughout the entire book, where's my, um, here we go. Where's my annotate? Oh, I can't annotate here, it's okay. Uh, because the entire book are laws and are stories and all the laws that we do find are laws that belong on Vayikra, when I have a set of laws at the end of the book, in this final section, the question is, are these laws only for that generation or for all generations? Hope that's clear now? Now, let me ask you a question now. These laws, who, who's going to fulfill these laws from chapter 33 to the end? That to conquer the land, the borders of the land, the cities of refuge and of Safhan. But which sleep is going to fulfill these laws? Will it be Moshe or not? Joshua. It has to be Yeshua, right? Therefore, who should receive these laws? These laws should be given to Yeshua. Look at the last line again. I'm going to show you something really interesting. If I go back to the last line of the book, okay? again, the last line of Sefer Bamidbar, we never have wording like this. Asher tziva Hashem biyad Moshe of Bnei Israel. Usually it says, Asher tziva Hashem et Moshe el Bnei Israel. These are commandments given through Moshe to Bnei Israel and Revot Moab. Why? Because in theory, God could give these commandments to Yeshua to keep. But out of respect for Moshe Rabbeinu, even though Moshe isn't going to go in the land, he gets the commandment to, 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 to relay them to the people. These are mitzvot, which God's giving to Moshe to Bnei Israel and Revot Moab. What, what I'm suggesting is, I have said the laws at the end of the book that for sure are for that generation due to the situation they're given our vote Moab. The question is, are they only for that generation? Now again, there's no doubt that the law of, um, of the women get nachalas for all generations. But the law that you have to marry within your tribe, the last story, according to, the, according to almost, almost all the Parsha name, that's only a law for the first generation. The people giving out the land, parcelizing it, that was only that generation. Even the borders of Canaan, those are the borders they have to, they have to conquer then. Are the borders, can, can they get bigger or smaller? That's a big topic that Rambam talks about. Um, setting up Ari Miklat, having Ari Miklat for sure. Where did Ari Miklat have to be? That's a good question. With Yeshua sets them up in, remember, we, in Sefer Yeshua, he sets up in the three different places. But where do we set them up? That's the question. Is that forever? Can that change over time? Let's say population moves and changes. Does it always have to be in Hebron or can it be somewhere else? Now, I want to explain to you now why almost all the other Parshim don't count this as a mitzvah. If this is a mitzvah the Dorot to conquer the land, what will happen? Um, let's say, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's read Parshat Nitzavim in Sefer Devarim. Um, actually, you remember by heart. What does Chumash warn over and over again? Chumash warns over and over again that should we not keep the laws, what will God do? He's going to punish us, and the worst point of punishment will be exile from the land. Doesn't God say that over and over again? We say it every day in Shema. You'll, you'll be kicked out of the land. The Tochachan Parshat Bechukotai, in the end of Sefer Vayikra says, I'll throw you out of the land. And in the in the Tocha and um, in Bechukotai, I'm sorry, in Nitzavim. Here, let's take a look in Parshat Nitzavim. Let me share my screen. Um, look in Sefer Devarim. Is it Sefer Devarim here? Yeah. Let's look in chapter 30. In Perak Lamed in Sefer Devarim. What's he say? When all these things come about, the Brachan Chala, okay? And you're already in exile, okay? You have to do tshuva, okay? And um, I'm sorry, vayaki tavo. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Vayaki vo elach ha'kol v'me elach ha'bracha b'chalashin l'tatel l'fanacha v'shivot al v'lavacha. 
when all these terrible things happen, of the curse, and will upon you, and then you want to do tshuva, and where will you do tshuva? Um, in among the nations where God exiled you to, then v'shavta ad Hashem you have to return to God, v'shamata b'kolo, you start obeying Him. What will happen when you do tshuva in exile? V'shav Hashem elokecha tshvutecha v'richamecha. God will bring you back from exile and have mercy upon you. Who's going to bring you back? We read this Pasuk Latin, don't we? If we return to God, he'll bring us back. What's that imply? That once we go into exile, who decides whether or not we come back? God decides. And therefore, there can be, when we're in exile, based on this, it can't be that there's a mitzvah to conquer the land once we, once we go into exile. I hope, I hope you understand my point I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to explain is over and over again in Chumash, we are threatened that should we not keep God's mitzvot in the land properly, God will throw us out. But when we're in exile, exile is not game over, but rather it's rehab. And who decides when we come back? That's what God decides. If God sent you into exile, God decides when you come back out of exile. And that's why the Gemara and Ketubah talks about, remember the three Shavuot everyone's heard of? That we, we can't rebel against the other nations. We don't, we don't come up like a, a, a storm against them, like a wall against them. In other words, when you're in exile, you are not commanded to return. You're commanded to do tshuva, and it's God's job to bring you back. Now, what's the big argument among Jewish thought is that how does God tell you it's time to come back? So at the beginning of Bayit Shani, that's exactly what's called Deuteronomy Isaiah in the book of Ezra. But when Koresh made his famous declaration, according to um, the second part of the Sefer Isaiah, what's he saying? That's not Koresh, that's God. I need a Navi to tell you, or at least then I needed a Navi, to tell you that that historical event of the Cyrus Declaration, allowing the Jews to return to the land, that wasn't Koresh, that was God. Remember the first line of the book of Ezra? The first year of Koresh, So there, there a Navi is telling you, God wants you back. Now, what happens when there's no longer Nebuah? Is the Balfour Declaration a sign from God, the Zionist movement? I don't want to get into the, into the details. But there's a very logical reason why in the, 18, in the 1800s, when the Zionist movement began, especially the secular one, 99% of all the rabbis say, no, you don't go back until God brings you back. Because they're simply reading Chumash, the Fiyab Shah. What I'm trying to explain is, based on all the Tochachot, this commandment to conquer the land and take it over, can only be mitzvah for the first generation. And then a future generation, if we come back, that's up to God, and, and has to be based on our doing tshuva. When God brings us back, we'll say there's a model in, in God might bring you back even if you're not ready, going to Echeskel. But that's up to God, but it's not a commandment that we need to do. Hope that's clear. The first, this first generation at this time is commanded to go in. But it's a one-time commandment for that generation. I'll try to explain why. In the future, once we're, what do you call it? Once we're in exile, it's not our obligation to go and conquer the land now. Rather, we wait in exile, we have to do tshuva, and it's God's job to bring us back. How does God bring you back on a, march, on a magic carpet? In other words, how many signs does God have to give you? It's time to come back. That's called do do fake, if you know. In other words, how many signs, in other words, how, how many hints does God have to give you if he wants you back in your land? And that's a topic for modern Zionistic discussion which I'm, uh, in my opinion, God's telling us through historical events, it's time to come back. That's what Rav Cook said, and that's what you know, all the Zionist, religious Zionist leaders say, that I don't need, I don't need a Navi to come out and scream, God wants you back. I just have to look at historical events, and it's clearly God wants you back. But something has happened in historical events that gives you at least a sign that God wants you back, but we don't do that. The, the initiative doesn't come on our side. Now, I want to prove this from Sefer Vayikra. Let me... Share a different screen now. Uh, let's open up. I'm sorry. Share screen. In Sefer Vayikra in chapter, um, where are we? In Sefer Vayikra in chapter 18. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Go to chapter 18 in Sefer Vayikra. It's the second half of Sefer Vayikra. What does God say? This is what he says. 
we read this at Mincha and Yom Kippur. Don't act like the Egyptians did. Don't follow their culture. When you come into Israel, don't you dare act like the Egyptians acted. Don't adopt their culture. Don't accept or don't absorb Canaanite culture because that, that culture um, was decadent. That was culture I don't want you to follow. And don't follow their ways. Instead, you keep my laws and my ways. I'm your boss. Then we have a list of what's called the Arayot. Remember? We have incest and all these forbidden relationships and sleeping with animals and things like that. And then after a list of all these uh, Arayot and Molech and things like that, what do we have? Pasach Abdalad. Don't defile yourself with this type of behavior. The behavior of the nations who were here before, which means the, the Canaanites, these type of relationships that are now forbidden for you, that's the type of culture and society that the Canaanites had. If you act the way they did, that defiles the land. But did Maha'aretz, the land became defiled because of that behavior. God said, I'm punishing the Canaanites for their bad behavior. But take care of your friend, the land is kicking out its inhabitants. You have to keep my laws okay? and don't do these toy vote. Don't you dare act the way the Canaanites did. The reason why you have the right to kick them out, I'm giving you the right to kick them out, is because of their bad behavior. God's not throwing them out because they're in your land. The land, it's, it was their land. God took it away from them and is giving it to you because of their bad behavior. Why do we need to know that? Listen carefully. You better not act that way. You better not follow this, this Canaanite culture or this Egyptian culture. Because if that's how you live in the land that I'm giving you, the land will throw you out. So if you don't want the land to vomit you out, right, you better not act that way. If that's why you act, I have to cut you off. Therefore, you better keep all my laws. And don't follow the toy vote of these other nations. Got it? So therefore, if God gives us this one-time opportunity to conquer the land, so the reason he's kicking out the other inhabitants is because of their bad behavior. Why do we need to know that? We need to know the responsibility that once God gives us land, how we have to act. But the commandment to wipe out the seven nations of Canaan is not a commandment for all generations. It was a commandment only for that generation, given to us by God. And God's explaining to us what gives us the right to kick them out. We're throwing them out because God decided I have to punish them for their bad behavior. But he warns us, I'm letting you, I'm allowing you to throw them out. Because I'm punishing them for their bad behavior. You better have something better. But if you act the way they did, you're going to lose your land. In fact, if you take a quick look in, um, oh, this the screen goes okay. If you look in the book of Malachim, if you have a full talk, you can take a look. Look in Sefer Malachim, Bet, chapter 21, Perach of Aleph and Malachim Bet. In the time of King Menashe, things are really, really bad. And what does God say? Menashe was 12 years when he was king. He's king for 50 years. Listen, listen, this is going to be the decree of Korban. The behavior of Israel during the time of Menashe was worse than the nations that got kicked out from us. Let's see the word Horish. Then we talk about all the bad things he did. And then what's he say at the end? He says, Because Menashe did all these things He's worse than the nations that got thrown out. And therefore, because of that, I'm going to destroy Yushalayim just like I was destroyed Shomron. I'm going to abandon my, the, the remnant of my Nachala, and I'm going to give them to their enemies, and they'll be wiped out. And okay. And 
Okay, that's the famous Zardin of Korban, the time of Menashe, that the Gemara talks about. Now, what do we see from here? We see from all these sources that, it, I'm saying logically, I understand now where all the Parshanim other than Ramban claim that this commandment to conquer the land and settle it, especially the mitzvah of conquering the land, is a one-time commandment for that generation. Because it's a one-time opportunity that God was giving us. And in that situation, he wants us, God's giving us the opportunity to set up a nation. He's allowing us to conquer the land and wipe out its inhabitants. He's warning us when we wipe them out, they're being punished, not because they're in our land, they're being punished because of their bad behavior. God is using this as an opportunity for us to set up a nation. But if we do a bad job, he'll throw us out. Once we're thrown out, God can bring us back, but that depends on our doing tshuva. And I think that's why the, the other parshanim don't understand this as a mitzvah de doro. Now, once we're in the land, then for sure there's a commandment to settle the land, to live in it. Of course, it's, un, it's only logical. So if we're living in the land, like the Ramban said, so we don't just pick up and leave and go to a different land. We don't abandon the land that God gave us. But if we're in exile, is there a commandment to wipe out people not living in the land? I mean, if there's non-Jews living in the land when we're in exile, are we commanded to wipe them out and kick them out of the land? I don't think we're commanded. In fact, probably we're not even allowed to. Because we, if they're living there, what gives us the right to kick them out? If, they, if we come back through, you know, in a legal way, if God sets up an historical opportunity for us to return, like the Balfour Declaration, or like uh, the events after World War I and World War II, etc., but if there's an ability to settle the land through natural means, so I understand the argument why some rabbis say, no, wait for God to do it. Another rabbi saying, no, God is doing it, and we have to do it on our side. So that's a legitimate argument, and that was a classic argument in the Zionist time. And God passed in like the Zionist rabbis. He brought us back. But once we're in the land, what happens if you don't have the entire land? Are we commanded, are we commanded now to conquer the rest of the land? Or that's God's problem? I hope, hope, hope that's clear what I'm getting at. And, and that's why almost all the other parshanim understand these laws at the end of Sefer Bamidbar as a commandment for that generation. This generation has a one-time opportunity to conquer the land and settle it and set it up. But that, that, that's not a carte blanche for all generations to wipe out any non-Jew living in the land and, taking, and, and possessing them. It, it's a commandment to, to, once you're in the land to settle it and not leave it. And you know, if you have the opportunity to possess it, to do that. But it's not a commandment for all generations to kick out any non-Jew who's living there. And I want to go back to... Um, the opening topic, you know, if, if you remember from like 20, 30 years ago, when they had all the discussions about giving back land for peace and things like that, uh, Rabbi Mittal way back sort of got in trouble for, um, his so I guess he was part of the Rabin government, remember? He got in trouble a lot for, think, now, what he tried to explain, which I don't think he, he got through very well, his whole point was not, um, what his point was um, that being a religious Zionist doesn't mean you have to be a right, you have, doesn't mean you have to keep a right wing political opinion. There's a legitimate argument in Israel what's best for our security? Let's forget, take God out of the picture for a minute. We have a land, we have a country, we have a nation. We have a problem with, with the Palestinian population because they're trying to kill us. What's the best way? What's the best thing for Israel's security? Is it best for our security to hold on to the West Bank? Or is it best for our security to give it back and set up a state? That's a legitimate political argument. They can be argued by political people. What would God want you to do? That's a different question. And I can't pass in a political argument based on psukim and chumash that were given for the first generation 4,000 years ago. I think that was his whole point. In other words, it, chumash didn't say you have to be a right winger politically. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you can be. It, it's a very logical, legitimate argument. What's best for Israel's security? But but if someone's um, security opinion is, it's not in Israel's interest to hold on to the West Bank, and I could have peace and, and live in half of Israel um, by giving back land, there's room as a, as a uh, you could be a, this whole point, you can be a religious Zionist and a devout religious Zionist and believe in living in the land, et cetera, but still be of the opinion that for the sake of peace and for the sake of better life in the land, than half the land that we're in, it might be okay to get back land. Now, that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do politically. That's still a legitimate political argument. And that he tried not to get into, but, but his whole point was, is that 
being a religious Zionist doesn't mean you have to be, you have to have a right wing political opinion. And the political debate was a legitimate one. You could argue either side. There's great people, great security people hold one way, other security people hold the other way. And that there's no way to know for sure who's right. But when it came to when it came to following the Torah, his whole point was there's no mitzvah de oraita that you're not allowed to, that you have to conquer the whole West Bank and settle it and wipe out the people who are living there and kick them out or things like that. And I think if I try to understand what led to that opinion, again, I, I didn't hear this directly from him, but my understanding of that opinion was when you study Sefer by Bibur carefully, it's easy to understand that the mitzvah of conquering the land was a one time commandment for that generation and not a commandment for all generations. Now, when you read Chumash, there's no doubt that God wants us to live in the land. You have to be blind not to realize that. God picks Abraham, this land for you. But you can't also miss the theme that when we're not worthy of the land, God throws us out. And to be worthy of land, to, to return to land, you have to be worthy of God bringing you back. And when God does bring you back, you have to remain to be worthy. And therefore, the, the main mitzvah of Chumash is not that the land belongs to us, but rather the land belongs to God. And he gives it to us ever deserving. Now, if you remember correctly, that's exactly the first Rashi in Chumash. Remember the first Rashi in Chumash? When he quotes Rabbi Yitzchak? What question does Rashi ask? Rashi asks, why does Chumash begin with Breshit Bar Elohim? Begin with HaKadosh Zelachem. Give us all the laws. So Rashi answers, I need to know right, about who the land belongs to. I need Sefer Breshit to know that the land belongs to God. And God's giving to us for a purpose. Now, he quotes a Pasuk. I'll, I'll share that Pasuk from Yermiel, which we're going to read this Shabbat. The Pasuk that Rashi quotes is a very interesting one. Actually, he quotes uh, the Midrash of Rabbi Yitzchak. We were kings before. It's in Yermiel chapter 27. One second. Bible. Yermiel chapter 27. Uh, God tells Yermiel to make these yokes and give them to all these, there's a meeting, basically it's the time of Sitkiel. Um, and God tells Yermiel, make Asedachem Masrotu Motot Natamat Sabrecha, basically put uh, bands and bars, or basically a yoke, like you put over an ox and put them on your shoulder. Okay. All the emissaries, the foreign ministers of all the neighboring countries, Edom and Moab and Ammon and Sor and Sidon, basically Lebanon, um, Syria and, uh, what do you call it? And, uh, and Jordan, they're all gathering in Yerushalayim by Tzitkel, planning a revolt against the Babylonians. And that's why they're gathering in Tzitkel. Now Tzitkel was, supposed, was a vassal king now to Babylonia because the Babylonians made him king after Yochim went into exile. And they took over the city. They let us keep the temple as long as we remain subservient. What does Yimriel tell them? God sends Yimriel to this government meeting and tells them, he tells all the emissaries from all these lands planning to rebel against Babel. And here's the Pasuk Rashi quotes. Remember Rashi quotes this Pasuk? I'm, I'm the God who made all the land and humans and animals and everything with my great strength and my outstretched hand. Untatia lasher yashar who do I give it to? I give it to who I see fit. Now, Rashi quotes that Pasuk to explain why he took it from the Canaanites and gave it to us, remember? But in its original context, what's God saying with the same Pasuk? Bata onochi natati etarsot eila b'yad nefuchanetzer melech b'vel avdi. Now I'm giving this land I once gave to you, I'm giving it now to the Babylonians. And I want you to accept that. And then, and then, then he says, after seven years, you'll get your land back. But Yirmiyah was telling the people, I'm taking away the land I'm taking away from you and giving it to the Babylonians because of your bad behavior. And therefore, if I follow Rashi carefully, the process, why is Chumash beginning with, with, um, with creation? In fact, what's the book of Rashid about? It's not to let us know the land belongs to us, to know the land belongs to God. God wants us to be his people. He wants us to live there. But he wants us to understand that land doesn't, it's not ours, it's God's. And we have to be, worth, we have a responsibility to land to be his people. But we better be careful once we have the land. 
Because we have the land and we're not acting as God's people. If the society that we build doesn't act, doesn't follow the laws of Torah, God warns us over and over again, they'll throw us out. Oh, our breed is eternal. Ultimately, we return to our land. God will bring us back at some point in our history. But once we're back, we might have to go out again. Again, it's interesting, of all the Parshanim, the Ramban holds, the famous Ramban, that there can only be two exiles, remember? Ramban holds the first Tochacha is by Rishon and by Shani, and there won't be a third exile. That's a very mystical approach to it, which is understandable once you're so many years in exile. But that's Ramban. Ramban has a more of a mystical approach that things are more predetermined. And, and like all the Galiot are predetermined, and this is going to be the final, the final redemption. The third one will be the final one. But that's a mystical approach, which is legitimate, but not the simple Pshad of Chumash. The Pshad of Chumash that Rashi was talking about in the beginning is that no matter when we have the land, no matter where we are, there's always a possibility of exile if we don't keep God's laws properly. But there's never a possibility that God will leave his people forever. And therefore, that idea that once God gives us the land, the most important thing we have to work on is being worthy of keeping the land and keeping God's mitzvot. And, and that's, that's two different approaches. Let me stop the screen here. I'm simply trying to show you that the Pasuk that Rashi quotes is exactly a Pasuk where God's taking away the land from us and giving it to the Babylonians because of our bad behavior. And therefore, what Rashi is alluding to is the reason the Chumash begins with Sefer Breshit. We need to know that the land doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. God wants us to be his people and is giving us the land in order to become his people. And we have a responsibility to become his people. But should God take the way land from us, if things go bad, it's, because, it's we're to blame and, and God isn't to blame. It's not that God didn't keep us his promise. We're doing something wrong. Now, that doesn't mean we pick up and leave on our own. But that means, should we be back on our land? If God gives us an historical opportunity again to return and build it, the most important thing we need to do to keep, to hold on to it, is the way we behave as God's people in the land. I think that's an important message. That's, that's, if I understand Rabbi, if I understand Rabbi Mital's Ashkafa, is that as, edu- as Jewish educators, you know, if I'm looking at like, um, you know, Zionistic rabbis giving guidance to a community you know, in times of trouble, in times of peril, what's the most important thing to teach and what's the most important thing we need to know in times of trouble? This, this, this deep belief that the land belongs to us, it doesn't belong to anyone else, we have to hold on to it. And we have to show God how much we love the land by holding on to every single corner of it. Or is it more important to build a just society and make sure that there's kindness and there's justice and, and society runs with honesty and integrity and, and we follow all the mitzvot of the Torah, of Tushim to you. And if we follow that, then there's a much better chance that God will take care of the political problems and enable us to stay there. But I hope you understand the two educational approaches that we find. And as Jewish educators, who are Zionistic, and you're trying to teach a message of, 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 of Zionism in our complicated situation we're in, there's a legitimate political argument, what's the best thing to do for security? Let's let, let the generals argue that. Let security people argue that. When it comes to Jewish education and Torah teachers, the concept that we have to be worthy of the land, we have responsibility of how we behave in the land, there are values such as integrity, honesty, kindness, um, um, and understanding, and, and, um, and social justice, those are no less important than settling the land. Settling the land is for sure it's important, and it's a great thing to do. It's a, for sure it's a mitzvah to settle, to develop it, but it's not the only commandment. And if I'm looking hashkafa-wise, if you look at the reasons for the Qurban that Yirmiyahu talks about all the time, you can bring, you can bring Yirmiyahu left and right. The reason we lost it the first time was because of, of, um, of a lack, you know, lack of social justice, a lack of integrity. In fact, I'll, I'll show you, um, just I'll end. Yeah, my time's pretty, yeah, my time's up already. Sorry about that. Um, I'll end with what we're going to read, the Torah on, um, the Torah that we're going to read on, on Tisha B'Av. Okay, so let me share my screen and share with you the Haftarah. Where am I going to find it? Um, the Haftarah should be, oh, just, oh, here we go, Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu, it's chapter nine. Haftar begins in chapter 8, but um, in chapter 9, he says as follows. He says, I I wish I could just leave this land and go to some hotel in the desert and leave him. Um, Because everyone is just dishonest. Everyone's treacherous and 
Menafim is either they're adulterers, but you can do adultery to your gods as well. You can simply have a lack of trust following other gods. And everyone is, um, is a bogate. A bogate in English is a, what's bogate? Um, um, a traitor, exactly. Okay. Listen carefully, what's the problem? Everyone's speaking uh, falsely. But you're about to say something bad to someone else. And just like you can kill someone with an arrow, you can also kill someone with your words. And therefore, everyone's out to get each other. And everyone's thinking. But the idea of like, um, like holding an arrow back ready to shoot it, litroch, like when you dorech your gun or dorech a, a, a bow, yeah. you get ready to say something. You want to get someone that... What am I going to say to make him feel bad? Okay. They don't know God will see in a minute what knowing God means in, in Yermiel. Okay. You can't trust even your friends. Everyone be careful of your best friend from your own brother. Every friend is really talking behind your back. Rechilut. And, and b- between your brothers, everyone's tricking the other brother. There's wordplay here on Sefer Breshit, isn't there, about Yaakov and Esav? Okay. Everyone's tricking and deceiving their friend. Lying and cheating becomes a way of life. And then what do you call it? Everyone's doing iniquity. Okay. You're living in a society full of, of deceit. And through that deceit, they don't know God because of that deceit. And therefore, God says, therefore, I'm going to bring, uh, God's complaining about an unjust society, people lying and cheating. And that's not why God chose you. That's not the society that God wants you to be. And therefore, your time is going to be destroyed. Then he goes at the end, What's he say towards the end? Um, um, therefore, God says, I'm going to come, this we read on Tishba morning. I'm going, to, you know, I'm going to bring their destruction. And finally, I'm going to send them out among the nations, nations they didn't know, and even those nations, I'll send the sword to get them. But God is super angry with his people, they didn't get the message. And therefore, he says, tell the women, start learning how to do keynote. Okay. Um, Women said teaching their daughters how to, how to cook and bake and build, teach your daughters how to sing keynote and kvetch and, and, and mourn. Because everyone's dying and there's destruction everywhere. Now, look at Yirmiyahu's final line. Right? Remember the end of the Aftar on, Yom, on Tisha B'Av morning? We changed the Nigun from Echa back to regular. What's God say? The man who is wise shouldn't boast in his wisdom. And the man who is strong, a Gibor, should not boast in his Gvura. And the one who is wealth shouldn't boast in his wealth. Now, Yemel isn't saying that it's not good to be wise, it's not good to be strong, it's not good to be wealthy, but that is not your goal in life. Those are tools towards a higher goal. There's nothing wrong with wisdom, strength, and wealth. It's like what Shlomo had. The question is what you do with him. God didn't, that didn't give you a land in order to be strong and rich. God gave you a land to be his model nation, and I can use wisdom, and I can use strength, and I can use wealth to sanctify God. What should a person boast in? What should be his goal in life? As a nation, what's our goal? It means to know God. We'll see what it means to know God in a minute. Can he ask them, why did God choose us? Why did God give us a land? God gave us a land and gave us a people and, and watches our history so that we emulate God, so that we live a life of kindness, of justice, and righteousness. Because that's what God wants. And then God says, live life of mishpat and staka and chesed, and you can keep your land. If not, you're in trouble. And that's how we end Haftarah. And just following Yirmiyahu, you know, says it's explicitly in chapter 22. Remember he said in the beginning, they don't know God? Remember, um, he said it twice in the beginning. Um, they don't know me. And again, at the end, um, because of birma, manu datoti. 
In this week's Haftarah, what are we going to say? We're going to read in chapter 2 in Yermiel. He complains about all the leadership, about how bad they are, and why the Korban's coming. What's he say? The priests are not asking the right question. They're not asking, how come God's not with us? They're not, saying, they're not asking, why isn't God helping us? But they're not asking the right questions. Here's the big one. You know what that means? The Torah teachers don't know me. What do you mean they don't know God? They're not philosophers? Knowing God according to Yermiel was something behavioral and not philosophical. It's not theological. To know God according to Yermiel is not to, like the Rambam says, uh, to know the existence of God, knowing he exists, believing only in one God. So it, it's knowing God according to Yermiel is a way of life. It's how you behave, not what you think in your mind about your belief, your theological beliefs in, in the unity of God. That might be important, but that's not what it means to know God. To know God, Yermiel says, it's understanding why you're chosen and what he wants and how he wants you to live your life. Now, where do we find this best definition of knowing God? Later on in chapter 22, and I guess we'll end with this finally. In chapter 22, what does he say? In chapter 22, he tells us as follows. He tells him, God tells Yermiel, go to the king of the house of Yehuda and give him, give him one final message. You can save your city. So it says, listen to that king of Yehuda. Let's sing on the throne of David. You and all your, your government. Okay? Komar Hashem. See the same phrase? Okay, take care of the poor and the needy and don't cheat and take advantage of them. And care about innocent blood. And when there's innocent and run people, when husbands are burning their wives and workers are dying in construction sites, that's innocent blood being spilled. People not watching, people not keeping health regulations and things. Okay? If that's a side you to build, then you can keep your kingdom. Your malachim, you can keep your palace, you keep your temple. Okay? If you don't listen, everything is dependent on the society that you build. The king has to be a leader that inspires the people to understand to know God. We'll see in a minute if that's what it means to know God. Now, he talks about how bad all the leaders were. Then he yells later at Yoyakim. He says, but you're building your house without justice, the second floor without mishpat. You don't pay your workers on time, okay? And you don't care about building, building fancy buildings. You just care about your own wealth and, and stature, but not about the people. He yells at Yoyakim, Are you in competition with the cedars of Lebanon? How big and tall you're going to be? Your father, Yoshio, Your father was a righteous king, Yoshio. He ate and drank what he needed, but he, his kingdom... He focused on doing mishpat and staka. Dan dani nive avyon. He uses political power to help those in need. As tov. And then he says, Halo hi adato tinu mashem. That's what it means to know God according to Yermiel. So when it says, V'tovse Torah lo yudu'uni, that's what they're talking about. They don't know God. In the biblical context, knowing what God wants them to do. And therefore, the, um, that idea of to know God according to Yermiel, that's why the Beis Amikus is being destroyed. And if God's going to take away the land, it will never be forever. We're always God's people. But when God gives us that first commandment, we're commanded to settle the land and be God's people. There's always a, a threat. God will take it away from us if we're not worthy. And there's always a promise one day we'll come back to it. But we have to do tshuva to be worthy. And once we're there, we have to be worthy to return. We have to be worthy to hold on to it once we're there. And what I want to end with, with this definition of knowing God, remember there's a midrash that says, one of the reasons the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed was because when we made Birchot HaTorah, we didn't, we didn't make a blessing before Torah study. You've heard that Midrash, Shalom Birchot HaTorah Tchila? When we make Birchot in the morning on the Torah, um, let me stop my share for a minute. Um, there's one, two things that we say in the morning. Remember the three Birchot, there's Birchot HaMitzvot, of Lasok B'Divrei Torah. But there's another commandment, um, sorry, let me get my screen open. Um, I'm sorry, I have to share my screen. My mistake. Share screen. Here we go. Share screen. And um, here we go. In Birchat Torah, we ask God after we take a mitzvah to Lasok with the Torah, we hope, we pray that our Torah study will be sweet. Let me make this bigger. That our Torah study will be sweet. No, it'll be enjoyable, like good, like good food. 
if you don't feel Tamchit Yisrael. And this is what we say. What do we ask God to do? Um, um, let me move this over. I'm sorry, one second. I made it too big. Here. Okay. We're hoping that our Torah study will lead us that all of us, we and our children and our grandchildren and all generations, will know your name. Got the idea of knowing your name? To know God's Kulani Yodei Shemecha Our Torah study should be for the sake of why God gave us the Torah, for its purpose, to be a nation representing God. And knowing Yodei Shemecha, according to Yermiel, is knowing God, knowing what He wants from you. Doing Chesed, Tzedek, Mishpat, that's the last line of the Torah. So we're about to engage in Torah study. Before we engage in Torah study, we have to remember what its purpose was. We're not doing it to receive reward. We're doing it to accomplish our goal. Because if I want to do chesed, mishpat, and staka, I need to know how to do it. I need a guidebook, and the Torah is our guidebook. So all of our Torah study is towards that goal. And when Torah study and the people, the Torah center, when the Torah leaders, when the people teaching Torah are not acting in a way that's screaming chesed, mishpat, and staka, something's wrong. And korban comes when you study Torah, but you don't make this bracha beforehand. When you're studying Torah, not remembering what was the purpose of God choosing his people, what's the purpose of God giving us the land, Something's going wrong. And therefore, one of the most difficult things in education is always making sure that there's a connection between what we teach, right, and the goal of, of why we're keeping the Torah, the goal of why God gave us the land, why we're chosen. And that's why I want to share with you, um, as far as the commandment to, to conquer the land, I want to, again, I dedicate, this is what, again, I didn't hear this share from Rav Mital, but based on my study of Torah and my hearing Rav Mital's um, uh, educational approach, I'm trying to uh, adapt the way I understand Chumash here to his educational approach, that with a, a deep dedication to the land of Israel living and settling the land and building a, a society in the land, but the primary goal is the type of society that we build. And when you have to prioritize your goals, the most important thing is gonna be integrity, kindness, justice, honesty, and, um, and, and caring about others. And it's important, but that's gonna be way more important. That's gonna be on the priority list that has to override um, all other, all other um, you know, within, within your political arguments, that has to trump everything else. And there are other values, but those values come primary. And to be worthy of holding the land, those are things we have to teach. The political argument, it's a legitimate one. We can argue, um, we can argue maturely between one another, what's the best thing to do. But as far as the type of society that we have to build, that has to be the main educational message once we, once we become God's nation. And how we do it, not just as individuals, but how we do that as a nation and as a people. Of course, encouraging students to take leadership and leading the country in that direction. Instead of complaining about what everyone else is doing wrong, people should take leadership and try to get other people to do it right. Wait, anyway, thanks so much, everyone. We should hopefully, um, one second, and do the screen, yeah. Um, hopefully, we'll get out of this, both the uh, political mess we're in and the, uh, the, um, pandemic mess we're in, but hopefully through our tefillot and actions, God's giving us a great opportunity to do chesed and mishpat and staka. How to do it, we can argue, but that has to be our goal. So yes, um, I'll stop here, and then there's another show, I think, in 10 minutes or so. Good question. Yeah, sure, question, uh, go ahead. So therefore, uh, when we listen to the shir, you're saying that there's no uh, uh, biblical imperativeness to make an annexation. It's strictly uh, um, a political decision. It, it, it could be that that's an, I'm, I don't I don't make decisions like that. I'm saying from my understanding of Chumash, I understand why some rabbis say this and some rabbis say I it's not. I understand that yeah. they could, you could say it biblically or you cannot. You say there's no, it's not a hundred, uh, not, it's, it, it, uh, it's not locus whether or not we have to do an annexation or not. I, I, I can understand why, why some Torah scholars don't, who read Parshat Masay, not the way others do. You follow? Right. Okay. I'm saying when you analyze the Bible and yeah. center by Midbar and it's set up, I understand where that approach is coming from. When you look at the global approach, when I go back to the theme of the Torah, why God were chosen, why gave us the land, and like when I take everything into consideration, I can see a logic in saying that there's certain times that it might be a value, but that's God's problem to give it back. It's not, we don't have to take that initiative. Well, don't, the same way we took the land by uh, the fact that we brought it back, don't we have to look at the same situation? Is it the same argument all over again? I mean, it's, a good, said not to come. It, it, it's a good argument. It, it's a legitimate argument, but a not halakhic one. 
it can might be hashkafa one is that what's God telling us? What does God want us to do? But I think we for sure you can't miss it that it, there's we want to keep as much land as possible and be, be build our nation. But to be worthy of that, how do we have to act for God to do that for us? Well, that's the same question. Yeah. So again, it's a legitimate argument all the way through. By the way, I'm I'm super right wing. Don't worry about. Yes, no. I know. Yes, I know you are. I'm, I live in the West Bank. I'm a settler's all time. But you don't. But you don't feel. You don't feel the Torah says we have to take it. I don't think that. And put it this way: I understand. I but like, certain people understand different, the Torah differently. Got it. Got it. That's all. Okay. And therefore, Thank you much. and therefore, and therefore, if they think other than I do, that doesn't mean that they're no. idiots. That they're ashamed. That they're evil. And they're leftists. They're being no. Okay. No. 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 <laughs> You can, you, can, you can be an ardent Zionist and a lover of Israel and, and hold, it's not good to annex. You follow things like that. I got it. I for a good reason. And I don't have to hate them for that just because they vote for a different party. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Bella, could you send out copies of that sheet at the beginning of the breakdown? Of, uh, I'm going to send it to the, um, let me see if, it's, if I can send it in the chat. No. So I'll send, I'll send it to... Um, to um, Emmanuel, and he'll, he'll send it to the group. I'll send you all the, all the source sheets. Okay? It's worth having. I don't remember seeing that page, and I think it's wonderful. I, I, I was sure that I gave it to you. I'm sorry. I, thought that, I was sure I gave you that share and safer by me, but earlier, I guess I mixed up. I forgot who. Maybe I that's the one I missed. I, I'm not prepared to argue. Yeah. No, I thought uh, I gave it, but I guess I And I do appreciate it. My wife said to me, get that sheet. Yeah, I'll get it. I'll send it, I'll send it to Emmanuel right now, and he'll give it out to you. Thank you very and much. To the Bat and the Bat Shiro will send it to also. Okay. That's terrific. That was a very important shiur. Okay, thank you. Talk to her. Okay, bye-bye. The next shiur is what, another 10, 15 minutes or what? Yeah.